In this video, we'll have a look at something you guys have been requesting for such a long time. It's procedural generation. In this video, we'll have a look at Perlin noise. Now, this is a large subject and can be approached from a variety of different ways, from generating textures on the fly, creating procedural animation, making terrains, and the list pretty much goes on. So without further ado, let's get into it. When generating textures or terrains from scratch, you normally want to apply some kind of randomness. However, using completely random numbers to generate a texture looks chaotic and, well, random. Instead, we use a noise function, such as Perlin noise, where values aren't totally random but have some relation to each other, which allows changes to occur gradually. We refer to these types of noise as pseudo-random. Perlin noise is often used because it gives a more organic feel without being too computationally expensive. And luckily, Unity has a function for generating two-dimensional Perlin noise built in. So we're starting with a blank project here. The only thing I've done is change the background color to black under the main camera. The first thing we need is an object to display our text on. Let's right click in the hierarchy, go 3D object and select quad. We can now reset the transform on this, set the scale to something like 8x8. Eight eight. We can remove the mesh collider, we won't be needing that. And let's now add a new component. This component is going to be our script where we'll generate our noise. So we could go ahead and call it something like Perlin noise. Let's hit new script and create an add. And let's double click it to open it up in Visual Studio. We can go ahead and remove the two using tags at the top and let's also remove the two methods. So the first thing we need to specify is the resolution for for our texture. We've already chosen the size of the texture on the screen, that's the scale of the quad. So this only determines the quality, meaning the number of pixels in our texture. And we want to do this both for width and height. So let's go ahead and create a public integer. This is going to be the width. And let's default it to something like 256. And then we'll do the same for the height. So our texture will be 256 by 256 pixels. Now let's go ahead and create a start method. And in here we first want to get a reference to our current renderer. That's because in order to change the texture on our default material, we have to first access the mesh renderer component, then access the material, and then change the texture. So let's write get component. The type of the component we want to get is renderer. And we can go ahead and store this in a variable. So let's write renderer for the type, and we'll also call it renderer with a non-capital R as the name. So now when we want to change change our texture, we write renderer.material.main texture. And we set this equal to the texture that we now generate. So let's set this equal to a function called generate texture. So let's now construct this method. First off, we'll need it to return a texture. So we'll set the return type to texture2d. We'll name the function generate texture. We don't need any arguments. And then let's open and close some curly brackets. Now in here, we are creating a texture from scratch. So let's start by making a texture variable. It's going to be of type texture2d. Let's call it texture and set it equal to a new texture2d. And the texture2d here takes in a width and a height. Luckily, we've already specified those up here. So we simply input our width and our height of 256 pixels. Then we wanna go ahead and generate a Perlin noise map for the texture. And then we'll send this texture back into the main texture variable up here. So we'll say return texture. So in order to generate the Perlin noise map, we have to loop through all of the different pixels in our texture. To do that, we either use a for or a while loop. In this example, we'll use for loops. So first let's write for, and we'll begin by looping through all of the x coordinates. So we'll say int x equals zero. We'll create a variable called x and set it equal to zero. And we want this loop to continue as long as x is less than the width of our texture. And every time we go through an iteration of the loop, we add one onto the x variable. So now this for loop should run 256 times. But our texture map is set up in such a way that each time we go one forward on the x, there are 256 pixels on the y. So for each of these iterations, we also want to iterate through all of the y pixels. So in here we'll say for int y equals zero and we want to continue as long as y is less than the height and each time we'll add one onto the y. So now our first for loop will run 256 times and for each of those times the second for loop going through all of the y pixels will also run 256 times. And so we'll make sure to go over all of our pixels which are, and I actually have to bring up my calculator here, over 65 and a half thousand pixels. Now this is also the reason why there's a lot of optimization when it comes to procedural generation because we're often dealing with really really large values. But that's not important for now, for now let's just try and get 
get this to work. So for each of these times, we want to set the pixel we are currently looking at equal to a color determined by our Perlin noise. In other words, we want to call texture.setPixel and the pixel we want to set is that with the current X coordinate and the current Y coordinate. And then we want to insert some kind of color here. And we'll go ahead and create that color right above. Let's create a variable of type color and we'll call it color as well. And this is where our Perlin noise comes in because we are going to set this equal to a value generated by our Perlin noise function. But in order to do that, we need to do a tiny bit of math. So let's wrap that in another function. We'll call that function calculate color and we'll give it our X and Y coordinates. So now we can scroll down and we can create another function. This one is going to return a color and we'll call it calculate color. It's going to take in an integer X and an integer Y. Now we can get the value of our Perlin function at a certain x and y coordinate by going math.perlinnoise, then inserting the x and inserting the y. And that's it, this will return a float with the value of the function at these coordinates. So we can store that in a float called say sample. And then we can create a new color where both the red, green and blue coordinates are all set equal to sample. This way, if sample is equal to zero, we'll get a black color. If it's equal to one, we'll get a white color. And if it's somewhere in between, we get various shades of gray. So we can go ahead and just return this new color. And we've now written our calculate color function. However, there is one huge problem with this. And it's the most common mistake I see when people are first dealing with Perlin noise. And that is we are currently inputting our X and Y in pixel coordinates. And pixel coordinates are, of course, whole numbers. Numbers. Either a pixel is lit or it is not. We're not dealing with half or 0.3 pixels. And that's not too fortunate for a Perlin noise function because Perlin noise actually repeats at whole numbers. So what we instead want to do is turn these into decimal place numbers. Instead of having them go from 0 to 256, we could have them go from 0 to 1. In order to do that, we create two new floats here. The first one is going to be our X and I'm just going to put court here so we know that we're not talking about pixel coordinates but Perlin coordinates. And we'll set that equal to x divided by our width. So the smaller the x, the closer we get to zero. And the greater the x, the closer we get to one. And we do the same thing with our y-axis here. So y chord equals y divided by height. And remember, whenever we divide two integers and are expecting some kind of float number, we need to also cast this into a float during the calculation. So we'll write a float in front of both of these and now we'll make sure to get a decimal place number. Then we'll replace the x value here with x chord and the y value with y chord. And that's actually one more trap that I see a lot of people falling into. And that is whenever we create a texture like this and then change around some color data, we need to also apply that data. And to do that, we call called texture.apply. That will take care of everything for you. It's just something that is so easy to miss. Remember to write that in here. So if we now save this script and hit into Unity, we can see that our Perlin noise script now has a width and height resolution. And if we hit play, we should see, voila, we've got noise. Now this looks super non-interesting and very gray. There are a few reasons for this. The first one is that we are currently using the default material, which is set up to work with lighting and I have zero lights in my scene. So let's just go ahead and right click in the project panel, go create material. Let's call it unlit under the shader instead of standard, we'll choose unlit texture. And we can now just drag that on top of the quad. So we should now see the texture much more clearly. The second thing is that we're currently very zoomed in. To change that, we create a scale variable. So at the very top here, we'll create a public float. We'll call this one scale and we can default it to something like 20. Then down where we calculate our color, after we do our division, we write multiplied with scale. So this is just going to scale our entire coordinate number up or down. And if our scale is 20, it means that our coordinates are going to be bigger and therefore we'll cram more of our Perlin noise into our texture, which will give the effect of us zooming out. So if we save this and hit play, we can now see the texture much more clearly. Let's also go to a Perlin noise script and change this from start to update. Now, of course, there are a few things you can do here to optimize it. For example, we don't need to get the renderer each frame, but it just allows us to very quickly update settings while the game is running. You can see what happens when I change the scale. Finally, also want to add the opportunity to pan around in our noise map. We do that by adding two offset variables. We'll add a public float and call this one offset x and we can default it to say 100 and we'll also create a public float offset y which will also default to 100. Then we again scroll down to our calculate color method and after we multiply with our scale we simply add our offset onto that. So here we'll write offset x 
And here we write offset Y. And in our game, we can now adjust these offsets in order to scroll along the surface. This is also how you make the texture random. If we were to create a terrain using Perlin noise and wanted it to be different each time, we would simply go and pick random numbers for the offset. In fact, let's do that now. Let's go in here and create a start method above the update method. And in here, we'll set offset X equal to random dot range. I want this to go between zero and a huge number. And we want to do the same thing on the Y. So now in Unity, when we hit play, it's going to be different every time. Cool, right? That's pretty much it for this video. I'm planning on doing another one on procedural generation. This time we're going to have a look at generating a landscape using Perlin noise. So make sure to subscribe so you get notified when that comes out. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in April and a special thanks to Derek Heemskirk, Faisal Marify, James Calhoun, Cyborg Mummy, Cole Cabral and Jason Latito. If you want to become a patron yourself, you can do so at patreon.com slash